tier, and I've had to listen to my poor seven-year-old son who got a new sled uh, in early December complain about the total absence of snow. Individualists, of religious entrepreneurs, of merchants and con men looking for theological justifications for their, um, <clears throat> their semi-ill-gotten gains. Uh, and Catholicism has always had a place in the United States, but it's always been a somewhat uncomfortable place. America has anything that you would call something like an ancien regime, some equivalent of the more hierarchical societies that are associated with Catholicism and Catholic politics in Western Europe. Those consist of the antebellum South, which whose wickedness led to its justifiable destruction, and my own Puritan New England, which remains with us in the stranglehold that the Ivy League holds on our national life, but otherwise has sort of ceased to have any real kind of theological uh, theological coherence, um, certainly nothing that the original 17th century Puritans would particularly recognize. So there's no, there's no ancien regime that Catholics can look back on and recognize as something that they might inherit or someday revive. Instead, the church, while it's been present since the beginning, has mostly been defined by streams of immigrants entering a sort of already established nation with an already established constitutional order, and for most of American history, an already established sort of Protestant religious center and Protestant mainstream. Um, and what that has meant for Catholicism is a series of obvious challenges, challenges of assimilation, challenges posed by anti-Catholicism, um, challenges to sort of make the Catholic political vision fit within a political context and political settlements that were not originally created by Catholics. Uh, but it's also created a certain kind of opportunity for Catholic politics in a way to vindicate its own perspective on the world by offering itself as a kind of plausible center, a kind of moderate middle um, for the extremes that American politics tends to veer into on both the right and on the left. Um, and individualism on the right and a heightened personal and moral individualism on the left, right? And you can think of them as sort of the politics of Hugh Hefner on the left and Ayn Rand on the right to pick mid-century American examples, a politics of personal liberation on the left and a politics of sort of liberation from any kind of spirit of economic solidarity on, on the right, a vision of sort of the heroic businessman and the expressive individualist as sort of the defining American types without a place for the sense of um, sort of social order and economic solidarity that Catholic politics at its best aspires to offer. And so as American Catholicism grew more powerful and influential and sort of 
partially assimilated, but not completely so, such, so that it retained a lot of its distinctives across the course of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, it became clear that sort of Catholic social teaching, right, a vision of an economy ordered to a world where, um, uh, you know, families could be supported on the wage of a single breadwinner, where marriage and family could be central to, to politics, but political economy could be organized around them, uh, a world that sort of tried to, um, in effect, avoid the temptations of communism and extreme forms of socialism, while also recognizing the justice of some socialist critiques of the Industrial Revolution. In that world, Catholicism went from being a sort of outsider faith in American life to sort of offering something that kind of filled the territory in between the individualism of the right and the individualism of the left. And so if you look at basically the history of American politics from the late 19th century, from the time of um, the great papal social encyclicals that tried to actually address the problems of industrial capitalism down through the New Deal era into the middle of the 20th century, certainly the 1940s and 1950s, um, you see a kind of unexpected Catholic center in American politics, where you had a vision of sort of moderate social conservatism and economic solidarity informing policies in both the Republican and Democratic parties to some extent, because the two political parties did not sort in those days exactly into right and left, uh, that I think justifiably gave a lot of American Catholics a particular kind of pride in what they had achieved uh, in, in this country. The American social order basically the post-New Deal American social order seemed to embody to some extent the vision sketched out by 19th century popes where you had sort of successfully avoided totalitarian and authoritarian solutions to the problems of industrial capitalism, but you hadn't sort of lurched permanently in a libertarian direction. Instead, you had established a mixed economy that was still dynamic, uh, that still had that still had sort of room for the entrepreneurial spirit for capitalism for growth and industry and so on, but that also took care of the poor and the disadvantaged and most crucially maybe also was set up for the flourishing of the family um, the the flourishing of sort of the sort of private institutions uh, the flourishing of a kind of you know a kind of organic social order that a lot of people had feared that industrial capitalism would destroy. And if you look back to the period immediately after World War II, Catholicism sort of sat close to the center of this general convergence within the larger streams of American Christianity, um, where it, it was a period when all of the different forms of American religion, the most prominent forms, be it the mainline Protestantism embodied by an intellectual like Reinhold Niebuhr or the African-American church as embodied by Dr. Martin Luther King um, or sort of the newly reawakened evangelical Protestantism embodied by uh, the, a figure like Billy Graham who was leading mass rallies in major American cities in those days. All of those forms of American religion seemed closer together at that point, closer together theologically and closer together politically than they had 20 or 30 or 40 years earlier. And Catholicism, far from being seen at that point as sort of a strictly alien outsider force, seemed to be very close to the center itself. And so in a certain way, the election of John F. Kennedy as uh, the first the first. Catholic president, however doubtful his practice of the faith at times, seemed like a, a fully appropriate culmination of this odd process where Catholicism starts out as sort of an outsider religion in a country sort of designed by and for Protestants with a certain kind of anti-Catholicism woven into it, and then ends up occupying this sort of middle ground between overly individualistic extremes and in the process, and again, this is sort of a narrative of the world as it looked in 1960 or so, helps reconcile Roman Catholicism 
to liberal democracy, right? So in the late 19th century, uh, Roman Catholicism is famously hostile to or skeptical of um, sort of liberal forms and the sort of emerge, the, you know, the emerging state, nation states of Western Europe. Um, and it's, you know, you, the, the popes will issue sort of cautious praise for the American Catholic Church, but also a certain skepticism about Americanism and the dangers of sort of the potential heresy of Americanism. And will say, well, you know, American Catholicism is in good shape, but it would be in an even better shape if Catholicism were sort of the established religion of the United States. So the church in the 19th century still seems to be sort of looking backwards towards the church-state arrangements of the Middle Ages and the early modern period. And then by the 1960s, there's and the arrival of the Second Vatican Council, a new narrative takes its place, which says, no, look at the flourishing of Catholicism in the United States, the unique role the church plays in that kind of society. It shows that if anything, Catholicism can flourish more under conditions of liberal democracy than it necessarily does under some attempt to sort of retain throne and altar Catholicism. And therefore, the church can effectively make peace with some version of the modern political revolution, make peace with religious liberty and religious pluralism. And there can be, you know, in the American experiment, this successful reconciliation between Roman Catholicism and, in certain ways, the entire modern world. Um, so that's, that's sort of the spirit of 1963, let's say. And it's a spirit that has its origins in this very real success that political Catholicism has in ordering American politics through the Industrial Era, through the New Deal, down in certain ways into the early 1960s. But then that starts to break apart. Um, it, in fact, it starts to break apart at just the moment <laughs> when uh, there's sort of this declaration of synthesis and achievement and culmination and transformation, right? Um, and why it breaks apart is an extremely complicated story that would you know, take hours of discussion to unpack. But the simplest way to look at it is sort of a series of underlying shocks undercut that kind of convergence of different American Christianities in the 40s and 50s. Um, the first shock is the sexual revolution, beginning with the birth control pill, extending through the divorce revolution, continuing in various ways down to the present day, which sort of severs the link between what you might call conventional middle class morality and Christian sexual ethics. So prior to the sexual revolution, it's not that, you know, everyone was chased before marriage and nobody ever got divorced and so on. There was obviously plenty of sort of normal human sexual complications in every society. But there was this, and, you know, the sort of the most stringent demands of the New Testament were often honored more in the breach than in the observance. But there was also a sense that sort of the basic Christian picture of sex and marriage and how they fit together, even if you weren't a particularly pious person, still made a certain degree of sense as sort of a guide to a healthy, normal, um, you know, sort of respectable, if you will, kind of life. And that, that sort of assumption dissolved pretty quickly in the 1960s and has never been recovered. And in its place, you have the sense at its best that Christianity demands something you know, radical and challenging around sex that's just really hard to live up to in the current world. At its worst, there's the sense that Christianity is repressive and cruel and vicious and homophobic and misogynistic and a whole host of words like that. And so no one should even want to try to live up to Christian sexual morality. Uh, but either way, the sexual revolution undercuts this sense of sort of synthesis between Christianity and especially Catholic Christianity and the American way of life. And then in a, in a more subtle but also important way, the wealth of 20th century American life undercuts the practice of religion generally, the practice of Christianity in particular, and again, the sort of order of, Catholic, of sort of Catholic society within American life that had existed before the 50s and 60s. Uh, the, you know, the, the sort of successful Catholic the sort of Catholic mini societies 
of the late 19th and early 20th century were urban, neighborhood-based, ethnically-based communities that, that, that effectively are dissolved by prosperity and suburbanization over the course of 20 or 30 and 40 years. And so American Catholics assimilate to a way of life that isn't in tension with Christian ethics in the most direct way that um, the sort of some of the issues around, it doesn't create the, the sort of sort of impossible to ignore tensions of some issues around sex and marriage and homosexuality, but it creates a sort of broader tension. It's more the tension of, uh, you know, you've got a busy weekend of youth sports, you know, at your prosperous private school where you're trying to get into a good college so your kids can, you know, live in a nice suburb just like you have. And who really has time to go to mass every single weekend when that's not really part of sort of your life as a prosperous American. It's that kind of tension, I think, that has been, that also sort of undercuts, um, under, undercuts, again, Christianity and Catholicism in particular. And then there are other forces. Uh, there's the impact of mass media, starting with television and extending down through the area of the internet, which creates a sort of spirit of relativism in American life. Not a spirit of atheism, but a sense that like the world is so big and complicated and diverse. How can one particular community, one particular church possibly claim to have a monopoly on religious truth? And doesn't it make more sense to sort of figure out religious truths yourself by sort of picking and choosing from all of the different options available in the world as it appears to you? So you have sex, you have money, you have sort of the media landscape and so on. Um, and then you have political polarization, right? Where the that sort of dynamic that Catholicism had successfully bridged for a while of ideological extremes of left and right tugging at each other as the, as the bridge weakens, the extremes pull further apart. And as the extremes pull further apart, religion itself becomes sort of secondary to politics. So there's a kind of religious left that is gradually just absorbed into the left. People who, who are sort of, you know, on the left and Christian in 1957 are just left wing in 1987 and have sort of substituted their political allegiance for the dubious burden of getting up on Sunday morning and mouthing some prayers you don't necessarily believe in. Why do that when you can just contribute to the Sierra Club, you know, make, make whatever kind of political donation you need to make first and sort of set, set the theology aside. Um, but then something similar happens on the religious right, where religious belief is more intense, there's more sort of, there's more sort of strong practice and allegiance among American conservatives than among American liberals. But there too, there's sort of a conflation of politics and religion that then creates a dynamic where people who don't share the politics feel like, they shouldn't share the religion. If you don't like George W. Bush or Sarah Palin, you start identifying against the kind of evangelical Christianity, let's say, that they represent. So political and political polarization makes it really, really hard for religious leaders, particularly, let's say, the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church, who are, who are supposed to sort of stand a little bit above and outside the partisan fray, to find a place to stand where they're actually heard and seen as religious leaders first and political actors second. And so you get polarization within the church where Bishop such and such is understood to be a liberal Catholic and Bishop so-and-so is understood to be a conservative Catholic and it's liberal and conservative that actually control how people read their interventions rather than the fact of their Catholicism. So all of these different forces sort of dissolve to some extent institutional Christianity generally in the United States, and they definitely weaken Roman Catholicism. And so you enter this sort of long period running from the early 60s up until the early 2000s that in one of my books, I, I use the term a nation of heretics to describe that, that kind of religious landscape. So this is a landscape where America is less Christian than it was 50, 60, 70 years ago where institution, religious institutions are a lot weaker, where the sort of Catholic position as a kind of potential middle ground becomes more difficult, becomes much more difficult to occupy 
Catholic politicians certainly are always being pulled to the left and right. But at the same time, I'm saying heretic because this is a landscape where Christianity and Christian ideas are still quite influential. People are drifting away from their churches or their parents' churches. They're practicing less. They're going on Christmas and Easter. Um, they're sort of becoming cafeteria Catholics uh, in a term that was very popular 20 years ago, maybe less so now. So they're, But they still have some kind of connection connection from childhood, a connection, you know, a connection of current belief to the Christian story, Christian ideas. They're still drawing water, you might say, from the Christian well. And in that landscape, even though Catholicism is weaker and it's being pulled from multiple directions at once, it still plays some version of that sort of centrist bridging role in in politics um where you know you the if you say there's a period in american life let's say it runs from 1975 to 2005 where if you say well someone's a catholic democrat you're going to assume okay they've made some kind of compromise with the democratic party's position on abortion but they will probably be more moderate on abortion than other democrats might be Right. And you can see the career of our current president, Joe Biden, in this light. Joe Biden spends a long period of his career being a pro-choice Democrat who is sort of pretty ostentatious about his Catholic piety. And as part of that sort of public performance, at least without sort of, you know, judging the man's soul, also presents himself as a moderate on abortion. Right, says, you know, I'm pro-choice, but I support this restriction and that restriction and so on, and I'm looking for common ground, and I agree with my church's teaching. I just, you know, don't think it can be sort of fully enacted in American society. And you have, you know, down really into the early Obama years, you have a real, a small but real cohort of pro-life Catholic Democrats in the House of Representatives, right? So it's still this sort of, even in a period of polarization, this indicator that being Catholic is a little bit different and a little bit closer to some kind of center than just your partisan loyalty might indicate. And by the same token, on the right, in different ways in different Republican administrations, you have a certain kind of Catholic influence that tries to pull the Republican Party towards the center on economic issues, sort of away from the most hard-edged libertarianism, right? So when George W. Bush runs for president in 2000 and, you know, says, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of those Newt Gingrich conservatives who want to, you know, cut your Medicare. I'm a compassionate conservative. What does he reach for? He reaches for Catholic social teaching. His, he has, you know, an evangelical speechwriter, Michael Gerson, who's weaving the ideas of Pope John Paul II into his speeches and so on. And that's, so, so there, there's a dynamic where, even though the center has sort of broken down to some extent, when you picture centrism in America, you still might picture either Catholic politicians or at least politicians somewhat influenced by Catholic ideas. And you have this world where moderation in American politics still sort of means something recognizable from mid-century Catholic politics, where you have a little bit of an emphasis on economic solidarity, a little bit of an emphasis on social conservatism. Maybe it just takes the form of Bill Clinton saying safe, legal, and rare about abortion. Maybe it's purely symbolic, but it's there. There's something there. And the public language of American politics is still, the public religious language, I mean, the public theological language is still the language of Christianity. America elects as its presidents from both parties men who are comfortable speaking the language of Christianity. When Bill Clinton gets in trouble for his affair, he reaches for the language of sin and repentance. George W. Bush speaks the language that comes out of sort of Billy Graham, Billy Graham style evangelicalism. Um, and this, you know, continues even through. Barack Obama, who has lots of different modes that he sort of switches through, but is very comfortable speaking the language of the black church. So that, that's sort of a world where America is de-Christianizing 
the challenge of Catholic politics is much more substantial than it would have been 40 or 50 years earlier. But you can till, still tell, you know, a, a pretty reasonable story where Catholic politics offers a common ground for a society that's still pretty profoundly influenced by Christianity. Um, and there, there's sort of a, you know, a, a common language that people can speak to some degree, even, even when they disagree. So, in, you know, a nation of heretics is still a nation that sort of recognizes Christian themes and ideas when they're raised and vocalized um, and still responds to them in some way that, again, a Catholic politics can speak to. And had I been giving this talk, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, that probably would have been the whole shape of the talk, right? With, you know, more detail and better jokes because I was younger uh, and funnier. Um, but, you know, and, and it would have sort of ended with a kind of exhortation along the lines of, look, l being, you know, th there's this big challenge, but there's also a clear opportunity where, you know, the kind of politics that America needs is still a Catholic politics, and your fellow citizens are still influenced enough by Christianity writ large as sort of a broad religious tradition that, uh, you know, they are going to respond to certain kinds of appeals that, that you can make. There's still this sort of language held in common. Um, and the resilience of Christianity is itself sort of an important thing to recognize and emphasize and so on. Um, uh, 10 years later, I would say that to some extent that is still true. There is still a lot of American religion still, I think, fits that definition of sort of spirituality that isn't orthodox, isn't fully Christian, but still quite influenced by Christianity. Even secular politics still fits that description. We are not a sort of fully pagan society that would be, you know, more recognizable to Julius Caesar um, than to Francis of Assisi, let's say. We, we haven't, haven't gone that far, but de-Christianization has advanced, I think. And it's also become clear that as you push further into sort of what I'm calling heresy, the connection to, Christ, to actual Christianity gets more and more attenuated to the point where, you know, you can say it's a heresy, but really the people experiencing it aren't really connected to Christianity anymore at all. Um, and I think this has become sort of particularly palpable on the political left in the last five to seven years, um, where, you know, you've had the rise of what usually gets described, including by myself, as wokeness, right, as a particular form of social justice-oriented progressivism. And the very term wokeness, you know, or as some people have called it, the great awakening, right, connects to the history of American Christianity, the history of American Protestantism in particular, the history of revivalism, and so on. And I can sit here and tell you a story where Wokeness is a heresy of Christianity. It obviously, you know, draws certain templates and ideas from Christian narratives, the idea of sort of the sacred victim, um, you know, sort of elevated to power and prominence, you know, the sort of certain kinds of sort of rituals of self-abnegation and so on. Like, you know, there, there's, there's a, a lot of things at work in wokeness that have some connection to America's Christian past. That's absolutely the case. At the same time, in practice, um, much of wokeness is, you know, just much more post-Christian uh, than, you know, the left of 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 60 years ago. An organization and movement like Black Lives Matter, you know, has connections to the, the, the civil rights movement, obviously shares certain goals in common and so on, but the civil rights movement of even the sort of Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton era is just, again, much more informed by the black church and the experience of African-American Christianity than Black Lives Matters is today. And, and that, that certainly holds true in issues connected to, to sexuality and gay identity and transgender identity and so on. 
again, you can tell certain narratives where you, you know, you can sort of, you know, connect, connect the links back to Christian culture and Christian ideas. But we've gone far enough down a road away from Christianity that it's hard to look at sort of the vanguard of the left and not say, okay, this is, you know, it's influenced by Christianity. Well, Christianity was influenced by Roman paganism, but there's still a pretty clear divergence here. And we're talking about a fully post-Christian left-wing politics. Um, on the right, it's a little more complicated because the American right is more religious than the American left. And most, you know, they're m most um, white American Christians are part of the, the conservative coalition. Um, and so from that perspective, you know, when you talk about a post-Christian right, a fully post-Christian right, you're talking about a phenomenon that is in certain ways more marginal than wokeness. The post-Christian left, you know, is incredibly powerful in, let's say, much of American academia. The post-Christian right is incredibly powerful, you know, in the memes that it posts on Twitter. These are not precisely the same thing. Um, but I think that I think that people who are sort of connected more to conservatism than liberalism, which certainly I am, uh, underestimate the importance and influence of sort of post-Christian ideas uh, some, somewhat, somewhat to our peril. Because I think, you know, what, what you pretty clearly see happening in right-wing politics in the era of Donald Trump in the United States, the era of a resurgent nationalism in Europe and so on, is not the disappearance of Christianity, but the subordination of a sort of specifically Christian form of uh, a specifically Christian form of politics to a more sort of primarily identitarian form of politics in which Christianity is one box to be checked. Like, yeah, we're, you know, we're European, so we're Christian in some sense, but the primary allegiance is to nationhood, national identity, um, you know, if you are sort of in, you know, in, in the world of sort of, you know, refashioning, refashioning maleness in some way and so on, it's to, you know, it's to male identity and Christianity is good so far as it goes, but, you know, not the wimpy parts, right? We can't, we can't have those. Turning the other cheek, I'm not sure about that right? You know, what's the point of weightlifting if you're just going to turn the other cheek, right? So there's, and, and there's, there's a lot of figures on the right who sort of occupy a kind of liminal space in between Christianity and something else. And maybe they end up, they'll end up pulled into Christianity, right? Like, who's the most, who's the most influential, um, the, the most influential right of center intellectual of the last seven years? Think you could make a strong case it's Jordan Peterson right Jordan Peterson there are tons of Christians who love Jordan Peterson and you know some days of the week it seems like Jordan Peterson is going to be a Christian uh you know he, he, he Bishop Barron has you know is in dialogue with him and might be receiving him into the church tomorrow as far as I know right but but fundamentally Peterson is a Jungian interpreter of uh, sort of human cultures and human societies, which means he wants to fit Christianity into a set of archetypes and narratives that are valuable for a more self-created form of human existence, right? Um, and in this, he has something, you know, Jung himself belongs to a period in European history when there was a really powerful non-Christian or post-Christian right uh, that took a lot of different forms, some of them relatively benign, like, you know, the, in, the sort of pagan influences on the Waldorf school that I sent my kids to when they were five or six, you know, where you've got a little bit of sort of Catholic stuff over there and a little bit of, you know, some gnomes and elves over there, right? That's, that's fine. And then there are some darker manifestations of post-Christian politics on the political right in Europe in the first half of the 20th century, right? And so this, the, the, I think the challenge, the challenge on the right is um, sort of seeing, seeing those realities f 
for what they are. That you know there is a there's a really if you are sort of in rebellion against the left and against liberalism, um, and you want the full rebellion, you know, well, the, if the left and liberalism are influenced somewhat by Christianity, maybe you're not going to get the full rebellion against what you hate about liberalism and the left from Christianity. Maybe you want something that's a little less egalitarian, right? A little spicier. And that's out of that out of that impulse, you can get into certainly some genuinely post-Christian territory, and ultimately, in some cases, some pretty dark territory as well. And again, I think these dynamics are not the controlling dynamics of our era necessarily, but they are real dynamics, and they're new dynamics. They're different from the dynamics of 15 or 20 years ago. They're different from the dynamics when, when, I, was, when I was a college student. And they've made the world, you know, pretty interesting. Um, politics, you know, as someone who writes about writes about politics these days, it's certainly an interesting to, a more interest. It's more interesting to write about, you know, Western politics and cultural debates today than it necessarily was 15 years ago. Um, but it's also a dangerous landscape, I think, in sort of a new way for Christian engagement with politics. And this is gets to the ending promised in the title, right? Which is that, you know, as American society and Western society de-Christianizes, uh, the presumption, I think for, for most of American history, Christians engaged in politics, Catholics engaged in politics, could make the presumption that even their deepest foes and firmest political enemies still shared something in common with them theologically most of the time. And, you know, I mean, we fought an entire civil war despite sharing things in common theologically, right? That's, it's no, it's no guarantee that you won't fall into terrible conflicts to have something in common. Um, but not having that in common still creates new challenges and difficulties. And above all, it creates the challenge and the difficulty in who your allies are, not just in who your enemies are, right? And I think one of the assumptions that a lot of conservative Christians have made uh, over the years is the idea that, okay, Western society is going to de-Christianize, but as it de-Christianizes, our enemy will become clearer and clearer and clearer. There will be the Christians over here, and there'll be the post-Christians over there and they will be, you know, secular humanists or pagans or, you know, whatever, whatever sort of label you want to put on them. Um, but we will, you know, we, we may lose influence, but we will gain clarity. And the challenge is, I think, that actually as you gain, as you lose influence, you can also lose clarity too, right? Because it's not just the people on, on the other side who are de-Christianizing, your side is also de-Christianizing. The Republican Party is much more Christian than the Democratic Party, and it's also less Christian than it was 10 or 20 years ago, just in terms of who goes to church, who practices, who believes in God. And that's going to continue apace for at least a little while. There may come a point when these trends, then when these trends change. But right now, if you are a social or religious conservative inside the Republican coalition, your allies are less likely to be practicing Christians than they would have been when George W. Bush was president. Um, even as the other coalition has de-Christianized even further. And in that landscape, you still have to make choices, right? Um, you st you, there, is, there is no, American Christianity is not about to be in the position of the Amish, where you have diminished to the point and separated to the point where you're no longer perceived as a threat and no one cares if you homeschool your kids for 37 years because you're doing your own thing. We're not in that position. Even in its diminishment, the Catholic Church is the most important religious institution in the United States, and American and Christianity is still the most important sort of coherent religion. And as long as that's the case, you ha politics is going to be a zone of contestation, a zone of potential oppression and persecution, and a zone of opportunity. Uh, opportunity to use the influence that Catholics and Christians still have for the sake of the common good and the defense of the church itself. Um, so there is value in 
projects of withdrawal and projects of rebuilding and projects where you tend your own garden and everyone has a different vocation, but some people are still going to have the vocation of politics and they're going to have to go out and do politics and they're going to have to make political choices. And in that landscape, you're always going to be faced in a de-Christianizing society with lesser of two evil choices, the kind of choices that, you know, pretty famously religious conservatives had to make when Donald Trump became the Republican nominee for president. Trump sort of creates a heightened version of this, but this is not, you know, this, this challenge is not going to go away. And you can look across, um, across the Atlantic to Europe, to the role that social and religious conservatives play in those more de-Christianized societies and see versions of the same sort of constant, you know, what is the lesser of two evils choice that people are making. Um, and I'm not going to end with some kind of permanent prescription for how to make that choice. Um, I will say that I was anti-Trump and, you know, in some way never Trump, and I, but I have also remained with American conservatism. Um, so that has been sort of the choice that I have made, whereas other people who shared my negative view of Trump have left American conservatism, right? So, you know, you can look at that and say, well, that's, that's my, you know, that's, that's the choice that I made, but it's a provisional choice, and all of these choices are provisional. But the, the important thing is to recognize that when you're choosing between sort of what may be two evils, at the very least, what may be two sort of dubious options for who your allies are, you want to retain a strong sense of what that choice is and the problems it creates and the challenges it creates. And you want to find ways to maintain your own integrity while making that choice. Because the real temptation when you're faced with these kind of hard choices is to make the choice and then decide that it wasn't a problem at all. And that your allies, there's nothing wrong with them. The only problems are on the other side. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing, every, everything is fine in your, in your coalition because those are the choices you've made and you want to justify them and ultimately feel good about them. And you, it's fine to justify them, but it's really, really important in a society where you're going to be surrounded by forces that are non-Christian, potentially hostile to Christianity, and that can take a lot of different forms, not just a very predictable form, to always be aware that your choices are not going to be ideal and keep that sense in your mind as you do politics so that you don't end up falling into the mistake that, frankly, a lot of Christians in much more difficult circumstances in the early part of the 20th century fell into where you end up making hard choices and then sort of justifying them to yourself to an extent that takes you a little bit away from Christianity itself. That's the temptation that you want to avoid. You want to be always conscious in this new and somewhat strange landscape that's still developing, <laughs> developing around us even as we speak that your first loyalty is not to your coalition. It's not to your allies, as necessary as coalitions and allies may be. Your first allegiance always has to be to Christ and to his church. So I'll end there. Thank you so much. All right, we have some time for questions and first, if you're a student, the first five, maybe six students, we have a book for you, Decadent Society. If you're already in my spring course, we'll order you a replacement since you already have that one. But uh, yeah, raise your hand if you have a question. We'll pass from Mike around. Hi. Um, thank you for the lecture. Um, so you, you talked a lot about the de-Christianizing of society, especially in the past uh, 10 years um, due to you know, sexual revolution, wealth, media, all of these things. And you talked about, you talked in terms of having to accept that reality and make hard choices in that reality, which is certainly true. But is there also another way of moving forward in which there is actually a way to combat that de-Christianization? Or, or do we just have to accept that in the political life and, and deal with it? Is there a way to combat that de-Christianization? Well, I mean, the goal, the goal should obviously be to combat it. Right. Um, 
And so I, I don't I don't want anyone to sort of succumb to a council of despair and say, you know, dechristianization is permanent and irreversible and we need to settle in for 275 years of, you know, making making unpleasant alliances that only grow more unpleasant with time. No, I think there's I think, in fact, that there's a, a pretty strong argument that the same forces that have accelerated dechristianization have also made certain aspects of post-Christian society seem more unsustainable, right? So, you know, if you go back even just even 10 years to sort of, you know, things like every, everything from rates of marriage and childbearing to rates of depression and sort of anxiety among teenagers and so on, America was a much more sort of socially and psychologically stable country 10 or 15 years ago. And as secularization has advanced, these things are not exactly causal, but so has this kind of destabilization, which in the short run, I think has, you know, sort of intensified, intensified some of the sort of the appeal of certain post-Christian ideologies to people who are sort of casting about. But over the long run, I think it creates a pretty big opportunity for Christians who, who, you know, have healthy families and stable communities and attractive institutions <laughs> um, to sort of offer to a fragmented society a different model of life, right? So I don't, I, I think, <clears throat> I think there are ways in which you know, the post-Christian society does not have institutions ready to stabilize itself. The forms that post-Christian religion take are not as yet sort of stable institutional forms. They are sort of individualized um, and, um, you know, sort of experimental and do not seem like forms of religion independent of, you know, some of their literal spiritual dangers that are well situated to carry people through the life cycle, right? Um, so all of that creates a sort of, you know, multi-generational opportunity for Christianity and Christian institutions to, re to reclaim ground. Um, and that absolutely should be a goal and a priority. Um, at the same time, you, you also want to recognize you know, the limits of, of what George W. Bush used to call strategery, right? I mean, I've, you know, I'm not that old, but I've been in the business of writing about Christianity and its decline and its prospects for about 20 years. And I've read a lot of, I've written a lot of really intelligent essays saying, well, the church needs to do this and the church needs to do that and the church needs to do this and so on. Um, and I've, you know, I've seen people in churches and institutions that have made good choices and reaped benefits and so on. At the same time, uh, you know, <clears throat> like forget the rest of American Christianity, just Catholicism alone is this huge hulking battleship, <laughs> you know, that's sort of sl sl listing somewhat in the water and has a million things going on at any point, you know, a million different factions and, and you know, sort of, different forces at work and different regional dynamics. The dynamic in Kansas is very different from the dynamic in New England. And it's just pretty hard in that situation for anyone to sit down and say, okay, here's my, you know, here's my five point plan for getting the ship, you know, getting this ship seaworthy again. No, you, you're going to be put in sort of very individualized and personalized situations in your family, in your town, in your professional life. And, you know, for almost everyone, you know, who isn't an archbishop and or someone who ha literally has to write about this for a living and punishment for my sins, you want to be focused on that level, right? That, that level of things rather than um, sort of saying, well, you know, you, you don't want to be constantly thinking about like, what's the macro level strategy for Christian renewal. You want to be constantly thinking about how can I be a Christian and make Christian choices and build up the body of Christ in my own life. That's, that I think is the you know the primary strategy that people need to be thinking about, and I'm sure someone else will ask a question about like post liberal politics or I don't, maybe not. I mean, there's there's one of, one of but you know one of the one of the other responses to what I've described, right? I, I mentioned at the beginning and didn't fully develop it, right? This sort of this middle of the 20th century idea 
that Catholicism and liberal democracy had sort of reconciled to one another, right? And so obviously as Christianity has declined and Catholicism has weakened and liberal democracy has secularized and gone in some pretty pretty strange spiritual directions, fewer people believe in that or believe in anything quite as simple as that, right? And there's a narrative among a lot of younger Catholic intellectuals, people, people I know well, that says, you know, well, the mistake was ever thinking that we could reconcile to liberal democracy at all, right? Um, and there's some powerful stuff in that perspective, um, but my general view of it is that it's more powerful as, again, as sort of critique than blueprint, right? That it, you know, there, there is within that perspective, yes, a very powerful critique of different aspects of where Western society has ended up, where American society has ended up, where liberal individualism has ended up. Um, but at the moment, there isn't some strategy of, you know, okay, let's say tomorrow you said, well, as Catholics, we obviously should support a Catholic monarchy in the United States, right? That should be our end goal. Okay, what, what is the plan from here to there? Well, you know, you can take a few steps. You can say, well, maybe we should bring back blue laws and, uh, you know, allow school prayer again and so on. And, you know, there's a bunch of sort of steps in there that I would support as, you know, as a social conservative. But you still have this big leap to your imagined empire of Guadalupe, right? Waiting, waiting, waiting at the end. And that's speculation about that leap, again, is something that, you know, maybe fits within the political philosopher's vocation. Um, but it's for people directly engaged in politics, forget everyone else, right? It's harder to see, I think, how that, you know, has sort of an obvious place in, again, sort of coping with the choices. And there is also a danger in that, right? Which is that, you know, you if you say to yourself, okay, the relationship between Catholicism and liberal democracy, it was an ill-fated marriage. It's inevitably breaking up. And therefore, we should cheer the decay of liberal democracy and welcome whatever comes next. Well, if liberal democracy decays in an environment that is increasingly post-Christian, why should you expect that what awaits after liberal democracy will be more congenial to Christianity than, you know, than liberal democracy and decay. I mean, it's, if you think the decay is inevitable and it's just like, all right, we just have to have to shape that landscape no matter what, that's fine. But there's, you know, a temptation to sort of cheerlead the decay, right? That again, in a more extreme form, you could see a lot of in early 20th century Europe where you had a lot of, Catholics who understandably really didn't like the liberal democracies that were set up often by repressing the church, right, in countries like France and so on. And sometimes those, as in Spain, those liberal democracies tipped into something that was like overtly and ruthlessly anti-Catholic. And it made sense uh, for Catholics to oppose it. But when those liberal democracies fell apart in the 1930s, their successors were, for the most part, you know, you could say, well, briefly, Dolphus's Austria was a nice, a nice Catholic state. I bet you didn't think we'd get to Dolphus's Austria so early in the evening, <laughs> right? But, but generally, the successors to liberal democracy were, you know, fascist Nazis and communists, right? And I don't think we're facing a fascist or Nazi or communist future in the United States, but... I'm also just not at all confident that, you know, that, that the problematic relationship between liberal democracy and Catholicism is worth sort of dissolving in order to yield something better when it could easily yield something worse under current conditions. I'll try and uh, offer shorter answers oh, here we go. with fewer forays into Austrian political history. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Kansas. Um, Thank I you. actually knew, know your mom. <laughs> <laughs> I know her too. What a coincidence. Uh, I used to go to, we used to go to St. Mary's yeah, in, uh, yeah, yeah. in New Haven. I go to St. Mary's now. Yeah. It's, uh, she's, she's gone further up and further in though. So The second, yeah. second greatest parish in America uh, after St. Benedict's. Um, so I want to push back a little bit about the post-Christian wokeness. And I have never really 100% understood this because I was, I grew up in the 80s when it 
everything seemed pretty woke and pretty much the same way it is now. I remember exactly the same kinds of things coming up. There's a new kind of tinge to some of it that, you know, the transgenderism wasn't yet a thing, although it was starting to emerge even then. And now I see a world in which the biggest podcast is a priest reading the catechism, and that's because it replaced last year's biggest podcast, which was the same priest reading the Bible. We have Father Stu, notwithstanding. We have, I've actually traced a bunch of pro-priest um, movies. You know, The Irishman ends with a priest scene. Um, there's the charity is off the charts. There was that Congo thing just this month where those people presented the symbols of their oppressors. And they all talked about how the Catholic Church was the one thing that saved them from these difficult circumstances. Um, that Nikki Haley quote from the Al Smith dinner about everywhere she goes, she sees Catholics helping people. There's um, The Chosen. There's movie after movie about Jesus. There's the Bible miniseries. There's, um, you know, and I remember growing up in the 80s, we read everything we read from Jane Austen and Mark Twain and Melville. Everything it was nothing but critical of religious figures. Now you see more openness to religious figures. And when I teach this in class, I kind of, my coup de grace is an article called The Overstated Collapse of American Christianity. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I read by that. By Ross Douthat, yes. who went to my old parish in Connecticut, <laughs> which points out that nuns are not really a problem Christianity wide in America. But the problem in the Catholic Church is kind of masking some growth in, not a huge growth, but a kind of a steady maintenance and trending upward of evangelical Christianity. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I don't see why it's more post-Christian. I mean, I think a black person in the 50s would have thought that it wasn't very Christian then. I know Frederick Douglass in the 19th century didn't think it was very Christian then. Um, I, I, it seems like we pick a particular brand of Christianity that was, you know, the hits heyday was in the 50s and see ourselves falling away from that. And we mistake that for, well, I'm just pushing back. Is, how is woke, wh why are you calling it post-Christian in a new way now? So let me start, that's a really, really good question. Um, and uh, let me start by, yeah, sort of finding common ground, which is the article that you cite that I did, in fact, write. Um, the argument in that piece was that there is a fundamental resilience of Christian practice in the United States that is masked somewhat if you just look at trends in Christian affiliation, right? And that, you know, there is a, there is a resilient core that, depending on the sources you look at, is probably stronger in evangelicalism than in Catholicism. It's, you know, it's a little bit complicated by, you know, sort of the growth of non-denominational Christianity and sort of where, where, that, where that fits in. Um, it is a sort of form of evangelicalism, but it's pretty different from like the Southern Baptist Convention in certain ways. Um, but, but so, yes, I, there, um, America is not a society in which Christianity is poised to disappear or poised to cease being influential. And that was, you know, I was sort of trying to, gesture at that at the end by saying this is sort of precisely where the dilemmas of political and cultural engagement come from, that Christianity is not headed for the catacombs, it's not disappearing, it's not ceasing to matter, but precisely because it ceases to matter, you have to confront these hard questions. In terms of what's changed, though, I one, I don't think you should underestimate the meaning of the decline of Christian identification and affiliation, right? That basically, a, I think, a strong Christian culture, you expect a strong Christian culture to both have a core of real zeal and sort of devoutness and sort of consistent practice, and also a penumbra of cultural influence that extends to the Christmas and Easter Christian, you know, the sort of the, the fallen away, but st or still semi-practicing Christian, the person who when they, you know, who do doesn't practice, but when they go to pray, uses, uses the Our Father or the Hail Mary and so on. Like, and, you know, there's a legitimate argument here, right, where, for instance, a figure like Russell Moore, um, who's a former, now formerly Southern Baptist uh, writer and editor, has argued, you know, well, no, it's good that cultural Christianity falls away because, for instance, cultural Christianity is part of what enables, you know, segregation or something. You have these people who sort of 
think they're good Christians, but it's just about respectability and sort of observing existing hierarchies and so on. And, you know, there, there's, there's some truth to that, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, I, I honestly think the more Catholic attitude is to want, a, you know, to want the sort of lukewarmly attached to still be somewhat attached, even if that means they're, you know, hypocritical or, you know, sort of, or, well, yeah, just, just lukewarm. And I know what Jesus said about the lukewarm. So I, I know I'm a, maybe on shaky ground there, but that's, that, that tends to be my view that you, that you want that penumbra. And when that penumbra goes away, you shift to a landscape where institutions become more hostile to Christianity, where it becomes harder to sort of just be an ordinary sort of Christian in a lot of landscapes in American life, a lot of institutions in American life. And also people go looking for religion in other in other places, right? And so, you know, there's some there there's some kind of cycles to this stuff, right? Like, you know, the 1970s sort of sees a surge of new age, astrology, these kind of things, and then it ebbs a bit by the time I'm a teenager, nobody knows what their sign is, and then suddenly everybody does again, right? So there's there's a cyclical dynamic. Um, but there is, you know, if you walk into a Barnes and Noble in the Northeast today and go to the book section, the religion book section, you've got, you know, four shelves for sort of Western monotheism and three shelves for basically Wicca, right? Basically witchcraft. And that's a change. That was not the case in the 1980s. I don't think that's a change that Christians or certainly Catholics should necessarily welcome. I, I think there is just genuinely more non-Christian spirituality, meaning not Islam and Judaism, but effectively sort of sort of what the Catholic Church would consider very dangerous spiritual experimentation in America right now. I think that is there's that is a shift from my childhood to today. I think what we call wokeness was certainly present in American life in the late 1980s, and sort of the political correctness wars of that era are similar to the wokeness wars. But the political correctness wars of the 1980s were at Antioch College, you know, in these sort of small liberal arts bastions. Um, that were sort of considered remote from the normal workings of American life. Today, that same, the language of Antioch College is now the language of, you know, corporate training in America. It's a big change. It's a big change, I think, um, that there is sort of a, the, that a, what had been a kind of marginal academic ideology 30 years ago is now a kind of consensus overclass ideology. And yeah, I think, I think, I think that's a shift. And, you know, I mean, just to take, to take the question of sexuality, right? Among Generation Z, 20 to 25% of Generation Z identifies currently as LGBT, LGBTQ+. Um, that was 4% uh, 15 or 20 years ago. That, that seems like a pretty big shift in sort of basic foundational social arrangements and in American life that is, I think, again, not identical with, but connected to the erosion of Christianity as, as a cultural influence. I could, I could, I could go on, but, but basically, I do think it's perfectly reasonable to look at the arc of American history and say, you know, well, people were, you know, people were practicing Christianity, but doing horrible things in, you know, obviously the antebellum South, certainly the South of the 1950s, uh, you know, we haven't even touched on the sex abuse crisis in the Catholic Church, which is, you know, a multi-generational phenomenon that influences and, sh and shapes all these trends. Yes, Christianity throughout American history has been sinful and flawed and deserving of judgment. But at the same time, you know, as, as Catholics, we think that it matters, you know, it matters whether people are sinning and also going to confession. It matters whether they're sinning and receiving the sacraments, right? And so we, we do have to think that a shift, a shift from a, a sinful society that practices Christianity to a sinful society that doesn't is a, is a shift for the worse, I think. I think we have to think that. I don't know. We'll see in 20 years. Let's have a student. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Deathnet, for coming here today to speak. Uh, my question is really to the first chapter of the first couple pages of the manuscript for that fantasy book you're writing, the Dawkins Children. And I was wondering how that, the experience of writing it and then coming back to it and seeing it over time and then preparing for this speech and looking at maybe including reactions to that and feedback you've received both publicly and privately among that manuscript and how how you see both sort of how your own perspective of post-Christian society changing over time and the role of sort of, let's say like old media, it's like print media, whether that's like local newspapers, like you see a lot in the Northeast or that's books like the works of Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and this kind of, it seems to be more, is that print media now in direct opposition with the themes and political leanings of visual media, media, particularly um, movies and cinema and Hollywood? Uh, that, that, those are a lot of different, different oh, topics. Um, okay, take uh, I'll start at the end and say, you know, I mentioned the internet in passing, but I think you have to understand internet culture as an accelerant of not just the crisis of institutional Christianity, but the crisis of all American institutions. Um, and I think there is a sense in which, you know, Christianity is a religion of the book, not to the same extent as Judaism and Islam, but it's a religion of the book. It's a religion of the codex, the written word, the illuminated manuscript, all of these things. The shift to, you could argue that the shift to visual culture was one that Christ, the sort of 20th century shift to movies and television was one that Christianity was challenged by, but sort of adapted to. The shift to sort of screen culture, digital culture, which is quite different with whatever... AI culture holds <laughs> lurking around the horizon. That's a that's a big challenge that's sort of somewhat independent of these sociological forces I'm describing, or not independent of, but sort of feeding into them in ways that aren't simply a matter of ideology and belief. And I think it's just really an open question and will be for a while of like what, you know, what is the Christian response? Is it to say, well, we need, you know, to take the current media environment, we need better podcasts, God help us, um, you know, <laughs> more more YouTubers, like a more, a sort of distinctively Christian digital presence. Is there a way to sort of sanctify that kind of media and change it for the better? Is the role of the church to sort of offer a kind of resistance to sort of perpetual onlineness, which is certainly my own vice and temptation? I'm I'm honestly not sure, but those are really big, hard questions that, yeah, yeah, again, are sort of connected to, but also somewhat independent of some of the forces that I've, that I've been talking about. I mean, the, the sort of, you know, what you see there, there's, there's a dynamic, um, I was saying this to Dr. Vance in the car, right? There's, there's some kind of dynamic right now where clearly our society is sort of looking for non-human intelligences, and we're looking for them inside our computer screens in AI. We're looking for them in the UFOs that are probably just weather balloons that our, our trigger-happy pilots shot That's down. That's not what you said earlier. Yeah, right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're looking for them by taking hallucinogens and, you know, speaking of sort of the 1970s returning, taking DMT and encountering, not you and I, but others, uh, and sort of encountering entities that maybe are manifestations of Jordan Peterson's Jungian unconscious or maybe are something else entirely, right? And I'm this, and it's, connect, it's connected to our technology, but in ways that like I, as someone who writes about this, I'm, I'm struggling to get my mind around it. And uh, the only thing I have to say about my <clears throat> sadly as yet unpublished fantasy novel is that it is... Um, concerned with uh, fairies. And I think that um, I think that sort of the place of fairy, F-A-E-R, you know, the pretentious spelling, um, is actually somewhat important to these 
questions, right? That like one of one of the assumptions of Lewis and Tolkien and medieval Christianity and so on is that there are there are sort of powers and entities in the world that are not God, but are also not just demons. There's something else. And I think there are ways to get really weird on you in which our society is sort of trying to conjure those kind of entities. I think that's sort of what we're doing. We're looking for, you know, the uh, the court of Titania and Oberon in certain ways in some of our some of our experiments, which, and that and that is too, I think, is part of this sort of post Christian turn that people are sort of looking for. They're looking for the Olympic gods. They're they're looking for sort of entities in between hell and heaven. Um, and the Catholic perspective is that those entities may exist, but it's a pretty dangerous business to go looking for them. And um, you know, we'll see what we find. How was right. that? Was that a was that a good answer? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Maybe one one more. Okay, one. I think we should take one more. One question. quick question. I'm really gonna, long-winded. I'll I'm also going to pull rank and call in a constitutional fellow. So if you're constitutional fellow with a question, raise your hand. Hello, uh, is this working? Can you hear me? Uh, Mr. Duthit, thank you for being here. My question is sort of a technical question about your book, The Decadent Society. And I was wondering why you don't use citations in this or you, you don't have any bibliography. Like, is there a reason why you chose not to include any citations in here or any footnotes? <laughs> um, it's all a fraud. I made it all up. And I've come here tonight to end my career. <laughs> um, so the, there, the, the answer is the degradation. Well, there's two answers. One is that as a newspaper columnist, you occupy a sort of weird space in between um, you know, sort of TV talking head and academic intellectual. And the academic intellectual must footnote and the TV talking head does not. And I sort of move back and forth between those identities. But there's a style, there's a style of journalistic writing that is not supposed to be academic, right? If you read, you know, a G.K. Chesterton book or a C.S. Lewis book, they're not filled, you know, filled with citations for everything that they quote. They sort of assume a kind of, you know, reasonably well-educated reader who will, you know, and and then this is the second part of the answer, in the age of sort of the internet at your fingertips, if you find a quote that you don't recognize or a name you don't recognize, it is all instantly available for better or worse on your phone or on the computer, right? So um, that's that sort of second part is the more sort of practical answer. The theoretical answer is that I think of my work as more journalistic than academic, and so I think of it as being sort of somewhat more casual and disposable, but therefore also less. I mean, some of my books have the the book I wrote about the arc of American Christianity is denser and has footnotes, and that book is supposed to be the book that you have, the brilliant book in your hands. It's supposed to be a little more casual, but the other answer has to do less with my self conception and more with the realities of the reader has the internet, which if your book is not trying to break new academic ground means that much of what you put in, uh, if it's sort of uncertain to the reader where it came from is probably accessible via a Google search. Um, the other, other, other answer, which can just be your window into the excitement, uh, is, you know, of, of adult life is that, uh, I write three columns a week and we have four children, which I know is not very many by, uh, <clears throat> Atchison, Kansas standards, but by <laughs> New Haven, Connecticut standards is, is a lot. And my, I said to my editor of that book, I probably should do footnotes. And he said, ah, you're a journalist. You probably don't need footnotes. And I said, well, I have two more columns to write this week, so maybe I won't do footnotes. But this is where we'll end. My wife wrote, my wife, who is also a journalist, but a science writer, and therefore is writing about much more serious subjects. Her last book, which is about the science of the maternal instinct, uh, contains hundreds and hundreds of footnotes, which I personally, as a loving husband, formatted in proper University of Chicago footnote style for her. So if you would like footnotes, her book is called Mom Jeans, and it's available on Amazon.com. <laughs> Thank you all so much.
All right. Thanks, everyone. And enjoy the rest of the food out there. Hopefully there's a little bit left.